so the primary witness on this, when I first heard about the case, uh, the first thing I did was verify he was who he said he was. Uh, so I verified that he had contracts with the DOD, that he had the technical background that he indicated, and that he was who he said he was. In other words, he lived at the location where he, his business was, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he wanted to remain anonymous. So that, you know, throws an extra kink into it. But he's not anonymous to me. So then I, my next step was to fly up and meet the guy because uh, even though I can do checks on him, uh, a check is never as good as meeting with someone and really double checking. So once I, I met him, I verified his, uh, the company that he owns and runs. Uh, I verified that he has employees there, uh, they're engineers. Uh, I verified um, all the type of information that made me feel that yeah, this guy is who he says he is. So I, ha I have no doubt uh, about what he's told me. That was Robert Powell talking about this, the Ontario Barbell case. We'll explore why investigators think what the Department of Defense contractor says he saw is a true unidentified object. Subscribe to join us. In August 2013, witnesses 1, 2, and 3 were driving on a remote logging road in Ontario, Canada. They had just finished hunting and were on their way back to camp. Skies were clear, wind was calm, and no moon was out. At 9.40 p.m., they were heading north when witness 1 noticed something. We were uh, roughly four and a half or five miles from, um, from the main road when I... Uh, noted something over my shoulder. I was, I was actually sitting in the back of the vehicle. Uh, this was a late model uh, 2013 Ford pickup. Uh, it was one of the crew cab style with a seat in the back. And I was sitting in the back. The uh, witness two was driving, witness three was in the, the passenger side front seat. I noted some flash, uh, some lights flashing. Uh, the very first indication that I saw that was uh, almost a flashing glare in the, in the right hand side rear window of the vehicle. I caught it in my peripheral vision. Uh, so it was actually just over my right hand shoulder. Uh, my quick spun around because I thought that was unusual because uh, we were out in the middle of nowhere, literally. It's, it, was, it was wilderness. And so my immediate first thoughts were this is really late for a helicopter uh, to be out in the middle of nowhere. The light methodically approached. They continued to drive. Witness 1 wanted to film it, so he got out his droid cell phone. Strangely, it was already going through a boot sequence as if it were trying to turn on. He next grabbed his Sony HD camera, but that wouldn't work despite it having 41% battery shortly before. Uh, by this time, the, the craft was probably at my 1 o'clock position, so it was about looking straight over Witness uh, 2's I'm sorry, witness, uh, yeah, witness three's uh, left shoulder. So it was about me looking from the center of the vehicle in the back seat straight to the right hand front pillar, uh, windshield pillar. And the, uh, the vehicle was at a low enough altitude that we could actually see it through the, uh, you could see it through the windshield. You did not have to be, uh, you did not have to be crouched down or anything. It was relatively low. Um, if I were to estimate its altitude, it was probably in the, uh, I'm going to say 150 to 175 feet of elevation. Uh, that was probably the highest it was at, at any one point um, through this whole thing. The craft has now flown above them and is in front of the truck, continuing at a pace of 15 to 20 miles per hour to the north. I, I, I told witness, told the witness that was driving, I said, I said, stop the vehicle, and he stopped it. Uh, he shut it off. And uh, we sat there and observed the thing. I immediately was, was going for my, I said, there's no way that, that this vehicle can turn off my rifle sight. So I, I had, a, I had a, a brand new uh, Nikon 3x9x50 by by uh, rifle scope. So I grabbed my rifle and rifle scope attached to it out of, out of my pack. Uh, I had my windows down, so I, was, uh, I, I immediately hung it, out, hung it out the side of the vehicle. And I op opened the side door and I was... Uh, observing this this craft and 
um, the very first thing that was that was intense was just how bright this thing was. It was spectacular. Um, having been involved with optical systems in the past, I mean, we're talking about a vehicle that um, this thing looked like a stadium lighting kind of scenario. It was it was brilliant in, in the amount of light that it was creating, and the lights that it, that it that it emitted were not uh, they were not. Um, incoherent light it was coherent light it was it was salty to my eyes it was just as if I was looking at it uh, into a laser uh, that, that had been uh, passed through a diffraction grating or something of that nature it was it was not a focused laser it was a it was a defocused laser kind of look the object is described as shaped like a dog bone or barbell with discs at the end of a bar lights on each disc rotate in the opposite direction while the whole craft rotates around a central point slowly. The entire object rotates about once per minute. Behind it, always opposite to the direction of travel, is an emission tail. By this time, um, both witnesses, both the other witnesses were extremely uh, worked up about this. They were, um, in fact, one of them one of them said, what is it, what is it? And I, I said, I'm not sure what it is. The other one said, uh, the other one said, just shoot it. Like he wanted me to actually rifle, uh, you know, shoot a rifle round into this thing. So it was close enough. You could have took a shot at it. Oh yes, and I believe I even mentioned, you mentioned that. that. Okay. Yeah, when he was looking out through the gun, I do remember, I do remember about, uh, I'm just making a wide crack saying, well, just shoot it, you know, and I don't know if I said shoot it, we'll maybe identify it later or whatever, but maybe that's what I was thinking. But, uh, you know, that was, yeah, that, that was, that, oh yeah, definitely close enough for that. And I said, I, I can't shoot around into something that I can't identify. And this is, this is a, this is a vehicle that was extraordinary. And I said, you guys just need to be patient and let me observe this thing for the next minute or so so that I can take in all these details. So over the next a couple minutes time period, I, I literally was making just a terrific number of mental notes as to what I was observing. Um, because I was using a rifle scope that had a fixed objective focus, I could actually zoom in and, and make mental notes as to the scale and size of things. Um, this, this vehicle was, um, I mean, it, it was huge. It's, it's rough dimensions about a now that we've uh, come back and make calculations about 170 feet in, in length, um, about 60, probably 55 to 60 feet in diameter on the outer, in the outer disc sections and about 20 or 21 feet thick. Uh, the other thing, just so you know, that I did, uh, because he sent his 17 page white paper, which Phil and I used when we created our MUFON report, uh, one of the first things I did is because he he provided the type of scope he used and he he provided the distance to the object because there, there were trees and so I felt very uh, uh, confident in his distance and and the angular size of the object right and then the distance to the object I was confident in that because he had trees in the background. So it's between him and the trees. So I felt confident of his distance. So then the question is, okay, what's the size of the object? So that could be calculated. So I calculated it and it matched the numbers he provided, right? So his was an estimate just looking at it and mine was, you know, calculating what the size should have been. So those matched up very well. The vehicle looked as if it was made out of a forged piece of mercury. It was it was brilliant in polish, and there was absolutely no lines whatsoever, no rivets. Uh, immediate, I'm a pilot, and I was immediately looking for all of the things you would normally see in an aircraft. I was looking for, you know, lines for the fuselage that would that would indicate a, a door or indicate landing landing gear, or you know, even even looking for a place for you know where's where's the propulsion system on this thing. And uh, I, 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 there was nothing to be discovered in that regard. Uh, what, was di what was able to be discovered was a very elegant uh, set of uh, what I initially thought were lights around the outside perimeter of this vehicle. 
actually turned out that they are they are anodes or cathodes of some kind. This thing was electromagnetically flying. It was flying by virtue of some kind of a spinning electric field. The witness believes the lights weren't being used for navigation, but were caused by a reaction from inside the craft, a byproduct. Um, I already knew by virtue of it not making any sound in any nature that it had to be high frequency. It had to be a frequency that was greater than one megahertz. For four more minutes, they stood in front of the truck and watched the object continue north. What they saw next startled them. Uh, as they were observing that, uh, witness, uh, one of the other witnesses uh, looked and said, hey, there's another vehicle, and he actually spotted another vehicle. It was identical. It looked, it looked similar colors, uh, and it was about two hour east. It was about two or two and a half miles distance. Uh, we observed that one for about uh, probably two or three minutes. Um, we also spotted a third vehicle uh, in that same time period. The third vehicle was further north. Uh, probably, if I were to put an estimate on it, it was, it was possibly eight or ten miles north, and it was at much higher altitude, and it accelerated away and over our heads uh, at a just unbelievable velocity. During the sighting of the second and third objects, Witness 1 pulled out his camera. This time, it powered on. You can hear recorded audio, but the video output displays what looks like an interference pattern. So we got three. This is the, that's the original one. Actually, yeah, the one that's straight. Straight, straight down the road. Yep. Yeah. That is the original one. I cannot oh, get him on. Oh, that was closer, yeah, that, that guy is going really fast because he's high. And he just covered the entire sky in less than a minute. You're talking one to the right. Yeah. The camera wasn't the only technology affected by the object. Witness One's phone never finished booting up. It instead lost power and was hot to the touch. A two-way radio inside the truck also failed. There's something else. As he observed the first craft, Witness One says he noticed something. Dark lettering, symbols of some sort, on the exterior. He drew this the next day, believing what he wrote to be mostly accurate, a 7 on a scale of 10, with 10 being perfect recall. But what is it? Phil Leach, the other investigator in the case, stated in 2016 that he consulted with a linguistics expert. They believed it may have some symbols in common with Cree, an Algonquian dialect from the area. Cree originated some 3,000 years ago. What remains is still the most spoken Aboriginal language in Canada today. The investigators' report shows they considered all options. But ultimately, they concluded this was a true unidentified because of three main reasons. There is no known technology to explain the object. There were electromagnetic effects on multiple devices. And testimony was consistent across multiple interviews and both witnesses who went on record. Why isn't this case more widely known? Is it because the witnesses wanted to remain anonymous or because the video is glitched? What do you want to tell the public? Well, it was an important part of my, I guess, a milestone in my lifetime. And um, I'm hoping that uh, by the story coming out that, that we might find additional people that have had either experiences and or can support some of the technological detail that we're looking for to try to explain how the vehicle flies and um, some of the novel characteristics that were noted out, out of this experience. Put yourselves in the shoes of the witness. If you maintain contracts with the U.S. military, would you publicly announce a sighting that would be inherently linked to your company? If you had employees, would you risk it? We also realize some may question the detailed descriptions Witness 1 gives. Is it too good to be true? Consider that sightings like this are rare. Powell told us the majority of cases he's reviewed are submitted by observers who didn't have near this vocabulary. So every once in a while, isn't a highly technical person bound to see a UFO?
Is this what that kind of sighting would look like? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thank you so much to our patrons, including Steve Lonegard. If you want to support our weekly episodes, consider joining us on Patreon. We'd also appreciate it if you share this video with anyone interested in this topic. Thanks guys, see you next time.